Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. Under any other circumstances, I think I, I would ask how much sense it makes to both create art and venerate the faking of art, but in your case, it seems like exactly the correct thing to do. It, it seems like it's totally in line with your, with, your, with your way of approaching things. Would you say that's true? I am most, most of all a, a fake, perhaps. <laughs> that is to say that I am always striving to put myself in situations where I have no business being. Mm -hmm. And call it dilettantism, you can call it amateurism in the old sense or the newer sense of the word if you like. But I think that I'm always looking to try try out worlds other than my own mm -hmm. and to see what they're about and to invite others into my rather um, ill-informed um, and somewhat awkward attempt at operating as a uh, cell biologist, for instance, or a, a real estate developer or whatever else it may happen to be. I, I try my best, but I certainly wouldn't hire myself for anything unless I were the cheapest laborer around, and quite frankly, I am. <laughs> it is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting here coming to you from what is not Chinatown, not Knob Hill, not Russian Hill, but somewhere in between those, speaking with Jonathan Keats, writer and also a conceptual artist or some say experimental philosopher. You might remember him from his appearance on the old show, The Marketplace of Ideas. We were talking about his book on new language that arose from technology. And now we'll be talking about completely different things. But I want to follow on with that, the, the idea of putting yourself in places you, you don't belong. The, the, the attempt to clone celebrities in, in Brewer's Yeast is one of these, no? Yes, I have uh, no background whatsoever in human cloning or uh, biology for that matter uh, or celebrity <laughs> but I guess that I came up with this title for myself rather grandiose but somewhat meaningless calling myself an experimental philosopher because it was just vague enough just open enough to kind of admit everything that I do and synthesize it in some way that made sense to me I guess that I've ended up in this human cloning business as in the case of all of my projects, uh, writing as well as art, out of an attempt to pursue my own curiosity about the world and to undertake what I think of as thought experiments, but not in the traditional stodgy way that happens in a university, uh, in a philosophy department where a thought experiment is done on a specific problem in a language that is accessible to uh, approximately 12 people. Rather, what I'm trying to do is to undertake thought experiments in public and to involve as many people as possible in those experiments in an open-ended way. And uh, so as a result, I've found myself most recently in this human cloning business. I take it the choice of celebrities and the celebrities chosen are, in a sense, ways to get as many people involved, i.e. interested as possible. I mean, there's, these are, you pick the best known people there essentially are alive, right? There is a crass side to it, mm. to paraphrase what you just said. <laughs> I don't know if I meant crass, but okay. I would call it that. Uh, um, on the other hand, I think that there is somewhat of a logic behind it. What led me into this line of work was the recognition that the arts and entertainment have been moving toward greater and greater degree of verisimilitude as time has gone on from the Venus of Willendorf up through um, Michelangelo's David to uh, black and white photography to movies and ultimately a hologram of, of Tupac. Mm -hmm. It yes. seems to me that this, however, has only gone so far. I mean, even that hologram, which wasn't really technically a hologram, <laughs> um, was not 
really up to the standards of verisimilitude that people seem to demand. Mm. And so I thought about what might get us there. And I realized that what might potentially work would be human cloning, that human cloning could be used uh, in the arts and entertainment, except that, of course, human cloning has it has problems. It, uh, technically speaking, is well, it has never been done. So I guess that would mean that it's difficult. And ethically, I don't probably need to even start enumerating the potential problems. So I decided that I would go about this in a way that would avoid all those problems. Uh, looking at cloning, it tends to rely on genetics, but genetics is getting to be rather an old fashioned way of thinking about us and about, uh, about how we work. Mm -hmm. Because really what matters we're finding more and more is epigenetics, that is to say the expression of genes um, as a result of environmental factors that turn genes on and off and make certain genes um, especially active in certain circumstances or um, make them mute in other situations. And since that is the process by which proteins are made and therefore you and I get made, it seemed to me that if I were going to try to clone someone, I should skip the genetics and just go for the epigenetics and try to pioneer a new field that I call epigenetic cloning, mm -hmm. where I kind of go from the opposite direction of using environmental factors and biochemically speaking, attempting to take uh, organisms that are not genetically related to my targets, to Lady Gaga or Barack Obama, and to attempt, epigenetically speaking, to get them to express in ways that are Obama-like or, or Gaga-like. And this potentially becomes possible by analyzing the diets of the celebrities in question, and then by taking essential uh, chemicals that seem to be part of those diets, and by uh, saturating my target cells, which happen to be yeast cells, in those chemicals to induce epigenetic changes such that they become uh, clones, not in the sense that the yeast is going to be very good at um, at running the country or even uh -huh. uh, performing on stage, but still that, the, that it can potentially at, at a cellular level become an epigenetic clone of the celebrity in question. And then I'm carrying this forward, of course, to human to human uh, epigenetic cloning, offering people the opportunity to become the clone of, say, George Washington or uh, Jesus Christ, where I am creating um, a program that you will go into with various drugs and potentially other stimulants that will cause epigenetic changes in you that will make you Washingtonian, for instance. But all this is a very roundabout way of saying that the reason that I have chosen the figures I have is because, first of all, they seem to be at the forefront of the entertainment and art and uh, cultural world that is one where every force from movies to television to the internet continues to push forward toward greater and greater verisimilitude mm -hmm in the absence of the person, him or herself. And therefore, I feel like I'm doing a, a service here. And secondly, from the crass end of it, that I'm opening an epigenetic cloning agency. I better have some good subjects, uh, some good offerings on the table if I'm going to encourage or induce people to um, become epigenetic clones. Yeah, I guess the first thing I wonder about is, is the task of collecting data on the diet of Lady Gaga, what are the challenges involved in that? Well, you have to be willing to read People magazine. Oh, a challenge indeed sometimes. And uh, Gawker and all sorts of sources. It, oh. it amazes me how obsessed people are with the diets of celebrities. And by celebrities, I mean a wide range, everyone from Lady Gaga to... Um, uh, to Michael Phelps, mm. uh, to Barack Obama. The amount that is devoted to whether Obama had the ribs or burger on the campaign trail, there's more attention given to that than foreign policy, it sometimes oh. seems. So my job is relatively easy. 
because I've tapped into something that people already are obsessed with. And that to me suggests that I'm in the right place, not only because I'm lazy and it is a lot easier to operate in this space, but also because all of my projects really involve, I think, delving into our interests, our obsessions, and our assumptions as a society, trying to find the things that are in circulation already and putting them together in ways that maybe they were not meant to be put together. So cloning and even human cloning is certainly one current. And the whole obsession with diet, another, and celebrity in its own right, certainly a third. And so putting all of these together, you end up with something very odd, uh, something that I call epigenetic cloning. It does surprise me that so much diet information is really available, but then it kind of doesn't when you lay it out like that. But are the diets of these celebrities significantly different from one another enough that that will be enough to make these epigenetic clones different, if that makes any sense? Well, let me read to you what Michael Phelps eats on a uh, any day of the week. For breakfast, three fried egg sandwiches with cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, fried onions, and mayonnaise, one five-egg omelet, three slices, three slices of French toast topped with powdered sugar, one bowl of grits, three chocolate chip pancakes, two cups of coffee. Uh, lunch, he has a pound of enriched pasta, two large ham and cheese sandwiches with mayonnaise on white bread, and a thousand calories worth of energy drinks, and for dinner, another pound of pasta, a pizza, and more energy drinks. So that is not really very similar to my diet. I don't know about you. Um, and well, this guy's is, an elite swimmer, so he's, he's going to be the exception, right? Well, Lady Gaga at least tells us that she's on a drunk diet, which is to say essentially alcohol with uh, occasional binges on junk food. So mm. again... This isn't to say that every celebrity is at that level of extreme. Um, in the case of, of Oprah Winfrey, I think that you have the extremity that she seems to have taken on every fad diet that has ever been passed off. Um, in that case, if I'm trying to epigenetically clone her, what I'm going to do is to take these different fad diets and keep switching things in that way. In the case of Obama, I'm going to look at other patterns – he has a White House diet that I think probably Michelle is the one making the decisions. Mm. Uh, very, very healthful um, whole grain foods. On the campaign trail, it's absolutely the opposite because he's eating for votes. Mm. I suspect that he prefers the chili and hot dogs, but I don't know. It doesn't really make any difference. What makes a difference in this case is that he's fluctuating. He's going back and forth between those two extremes. And also that he, at least back in the uh, first campaign, he said that one of his favorite foods was Nicorette. He used to be a oh. smoker and uh, at least until recently, he was chewing Nicorette. So in the case of my uh, yeast colony that will be cloned to become Obama, I will uh, include nicotine in that diet. I think of eating for votes, and I, I just can't help but have my mind go back to the time John Kerry uh, had the wrong cheese on his on his Philly cheese steak. I mean, this eating for votes meaning you you, you are dining out with uh, with influential groups, or you are actually having a photo op eating something unhealthy and local. I think that it's both, and I think that if you're a good politician, you combine them. Mm. Um, certainly, the campaign trail seems to be primarily a path of familiarity or feigning familiarity with as many constituencies as possible. And what we eat is so much a part of who we are socially, uh, the dining room, the kitchen, the sitting together at a table is so much a part of the social nexus and probably is one of the origins of it. So that I think that it is actually a very powerful signifier mm. looking at what the president is eating and how, who he's eating it with. The fact that he's sitting not at a table, but he's sitting up at the counter at a diner. This is a very powerful signifier. 
with the amount of people who, who are enthusiastically following the diets of their favorite celebrities are already, I mean, can we say they are engaged in a project of trying to make themselves epigenetic clones of their, their idols? I've thought about this, and I think that that may be the consequence. Mm. It also may be the consequence of a uh, husband and wife, for instance, who are mostly eating the same things, that there's some sort of a closeness that comes about through some through through some epigenetic means mm-hmm. i would not say that it has been intentional as far as i know i mean you can always start out by uh, googling and epigenetic cloning is not a term that comes up until now yes. i hope i would say that there is some level of emulation that is taking place when you go on the diet of your favorite celebrity and that that emulation taking place is certainly an urge to become a clone of that celebrity, but it is not an urge that is scientifically uh, motivated or scientifically vetted. Mm. It's more of a more of a simple imitative impulse. Yes, it is. And if you think about science, what it is and what it does. I think that there is a very strong vernacular foundation for it, which is to say that what goes on inside the Large Hadron Collider is not at all similar to what goes on in your kitchen. Mm. But certainly the path from looking up at the stars and kicking the dirt to the Large Hadron Collider is one of familiar observation and trying to make sense of whatever it is that you that you experience and coming up with a theory to explain it and then coming up with observations that can support that theory or not and so forth as sort of bootstrapping mm. so to me it always makes sense to attempt to uh, regroup so to speak to think about how we can find that vernacular again. And that is, I guess, another reason why I call myself an experimental philosopher, experimental philosopher or a natural philosopher. This is a term that comes out of the 17th, 18th century. And it is a term for someone who would go about experimenting on anything, everything, him or herself, for that matter, trying, just trying to figure things out. Uh, it was a sort of early form of science that was still a form of science that was very much based on personal individual experience. And I'm trying to encourage that, not because I think that what happens in laboratories with a team of a thousand researchers is necessarily uh, wrong or bad, but because I think that we need this other path as well, since what tends to happen is that you create an echo chamber, uh, maybe literally in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, but certainly figuratively you do in any laboratory, in any scientific practice where you have a way in which theories become self-reinforcing out of sheer momentum and out of uh, the sheer need to to get tenure. I should make listeners aware that you have a book coming out in December called uh, Forged, Why Fakes Are the Great Art of Our Age. And I can't help but ask... Whether cloning a celebrity genetically or epigenetically, when when can you say it becomes a species of celebrity forgery, does it? I only started thinking about this after I started working on the cloning project, that there was a way in which I was uh, kind of uh, lapping back on some of the topics that I had been writing about. I'm always cribbing myself in one way or another, I suppose. I believe that the nature of fakery, what is authentic and what is not, is one of the most difficult problems, which you and I clearly 
share an interest in by virtue of the name that you've given this show <laughs> and by the Vim Vel- by the Vim Vendors film that it pays tribute to. You're but- the only guest to point that out, by the way, ever. So <laughs> nice. It's a, a favorite film of mine because I think that it gets into this problem uh, with an incredible depth and Vendors is intelligent enough and subtle enough not to inflict any answers on us. Hmm. Now, I guess we should explain a little more about this film, Notebook on Cities and Clothes, it's a portrait of Yoji Yamamoto. I mean, what, what, uh, how, how for you did it tap into this, this intellectual vein of, of forgery-related issues? Maybe would you like to summarize the film a little bit since you probably have a better memory of the specifics of it and then right well what i'm trying to think of what best to say about it because anybody who's watched a vim vendors documentary knows that you you're not really going to summarize it because it ends up being so personal to vim vendors and then it becomes personal to the viewer again and it goes through these these layers i should i should just dump the sound from the trailer in here or something like that you know i let, let me try let me say this give me give me your impressions at a distance, since it's been a while since you've seen it, I'll fill in what I need to. But what, uh, through through your own filters, what do you what do you remember that is valid or valid relevant? Well, what I remember pertains to vendors attempting to follow the path of uh, simulacra mm-hmm. and the the fact that whenever he seems to be looking at a copy looked at from another perspective, he seems to be looking at an original. Hmm. The Hall of Mirrors intellectually that he is exploring in the film to me feels like a perfect parallel to the mirroring that takes place between original and copy Hmm. that we take to be a one-to-one correspondence. But of course, as anyone who's ever looked at a kaleidoscope knows, one-to-one correspondence no longer is one-to-one right. the moment that, that that one thing starts reflecting off another. You know, there's another film, more in the zeitgeist, now that I think about it, that may be relevant to discuss here, which is Abbas Kerostami's certified copy. Was that one you saw? I have not seen that. Oh, you got to see that now. Now, now, I, now I'm making you a recommendation, a certified copy. But I'm sure it's a, a film you've heard of, right? It is on the Netflix list. <laughs> Near the top of the queue, I hope? Is it, is it at least within the top 20, 30? I think this queue only goes to 30. Oh, Okay. Fair enough. Most people's go to about 500, 400 of which they will never see in their lifetime. <laughs> so you're playing it the right way. But the theme of, of forgery, what's a copy and what's real, it's, I mean, it's not just those two films. You, it seems like it pops up almost wherever you want to find it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a theme more widely covered in, in an indirect way than, than one would initially think, no? Well, yes, there is an enormous amount of paranoia Mm -hmm. over whether something is authentic. And I think that this is partly to do with the fact that copying is nearly ubiquitous Mm -hmm. and that the mode of copying produces in many cases something that is not qualitatively different from the original because the original exists in a form that given the technology of our time can be in a perfect one-to-one correspondence with as many copies as you like. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, the industrial revolution and the effect that that had on the attitude toward a painting that was identical or similar to another one, I think that we're seeing a great, a greater and greater extreme of what was already starting then. That is to say that if you look at uh, an artist in the 1600s or 1700s, to be able to produce a perfect copy 
was extraordinary and was a tribute. Mm. But once the mechanical means to make reproduction in color, especially came along for the image, suddenly the original became valuable because it was an original and the relationship between image and object changed in a way. And that is, I think, what we continue to see happening, not only in the case of image, but in the case of sound, in the case of motion, in the case potentially of absolutely everything. When you start looking at 3D printing and the potential for anything to be produced in as many copies as you want, simply because the original is a set of specs, the original is a set of coordinates. We have a great many scared industries and more to come because of this, correct? It would seem that way. Perhaps the industry that you're in is one of those. And the industries that I am in, I suppose, are also amongst the threatened. Uh, What a book is these days, for instance, I don't think anyone knows anymore. Mm. And what content is, well, we have some idea that Content is something that is protected potentially by copyright and that copyright potentially protects something that sometimes is called content, but it's a circular argument. And Mm -hmm. I don't know that really given the way in which material is accumulated and communicated and the many paths of cross-pollination and remixing, whether those terms really are pertinent now or can stand for very long. The the term content itself, I feel like I wasn't hearing that until certainly the last 10 years. I mean, when, when did you first start hearing people label this stuff as content? I feel like it's recent. I think that it is recent, and I think that it was at a moment when well, form and content, I suppose, would be the two uh, the two parts of that equation. Form is implied when you speak of content. And the moment at which content could be released from form and did not require any given form in order for it to subsist, let's say, mm. that content was free. I mean, it's interesting to think about whether we really can speak of content if we think about a couple hundred years ago, what anyone would have experienced. Would anything have really been um, uh, independent of platform, again, to use a terminology that is our own? Yes. I can't think of anything that would be. Certainly you could say that something that was on papyrus got transcribed onto, um, onto paper and the printed book certainly made a certain, well, the printed book in a sense liberated the word from the page. So I don't want to say that we live in a time now that is different in kind from the past, but I think that the uh, promiscuity of content, or in other words, that which is not form, has perhaps uh, changed in degree to such an extent that that is why this terminology makes sense now. Mm. In this moment to write a book about forgery, it it seems an appropriate moment because given what you've just said, the concept of forgery may itself be on its way out. The concept of forgery, I think, is on its way out but also on its way in. Mm. Uh, The more that we seem to be able to have anything, anywhere, anytime, because it is independent of platform, the more that the art world, for instance, the, the more that any sort of financial system will insist on this versus that and this versus that as it becomes more trivial 
what the differences are between this and that, the more entrenched those economic forces will become in terms of insisting on that difference. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the trace of the artist is one that starts in the early 20th century, really, to become prevalent. The, the, the artist's hand, um, this idea that somehow there is something about the unique object that is special, that, that gives it value, and that gives you value by virtue of the fact that you have it and someone else doesn't. Mm. The more that technology allows, for instance, for the mass production of paintings uh, using inkjet or some other technology that potentially are not differentiable from the so-called original, mm. the more that that happens, the more insistence there's going to be on the original being the original and therefore being special. This is the last artist I expected to bring up in any conversation, but my mind goes right to the vast operation run in, in malls across America by the late Thomas Kincaid, who would paint something like the Golden Gate Bridge here in San Francisco, and I guess print it in some form thousands of times. You could custom order the size, even, of, of the painting of the Golden Gate Bridge you'd buy from him, and then he would have a one of his vast staff paint highlights of physical paint onto it in a, a process that, while aesthetically unappealing, to me at least, seems to be, it seems to fit into this liminal zone in this whole discussion, doesn't it? Are, are, were you aware of, of his way of doing things? I actually spent a fair amount of time reading about him because mm. he fascinates me in maybe a somewhat morbid way. <laughs> um, you know more than I do about his method then, so go, go on. I don't know that I know more about it, but a sort of curious overlap which really isn't one, but we'll pretend for the moment, is with the work of the single most forged artist in history, or so we're mm -hmm. told, uh, Corot. Um, there's an expression that is that um, Corot made a thousand paintings of which 10,000 are in America. <laughs> and the number goes up every time that you see this in print somewhere, if you look at the date when it was published. Mm. Corot was also one of the most tolerant of artists when it came to what we might now call forgery. Mm. And is, is that why there are so many? Because he didn't happen to care that much? There are a number of reasons that have to do with the style that he was painting in was so incredibly appealing mm. that there were many artists who wanted to paint like that. And so sometimes they would bring him paintings to show him. And there was no attempt at deception necessarily. And he would say, well, yes, uh, very good. But he would take his brush and then just put a dot of paint here and a dot there. And if you ever look at his paintings closely, you see that it's those little dots of paint that make a Corot a Corot, mm -hmm. that, that, that make it so brilliant at the level of how he understood light. And so often what would happen is that the artist having had those couple dots added would say, well, you know, you've improved it so much. Would you mind signing it as well? And Corot would apparently be happy to do so. But more generally, Corot doesn't really seem to have in any way tried to enforce his copyright on this, uh, on this aesthetic. And many other artists seem to have been encouraged at various levels by him, either directly or indirectly. And so the reason that there are so many of these has to do with reattribution, hopeful reattribution on the part of some uh, downright fraudulent reattribution on the part of others mm -hmm. that led to a vast body of work, all from the same time period, all in the same style, at various levels of quality. And Corot himself was relatively prolific. So as a result, there's a range of quality in his own work. So at a certain point, you do have to ask whether the distinction is really a meaningful one. And I think that that's a question that he at some level was asking, but that at this stage in history, we are a lot less able to ask in spite of the fact that at this stage in history, we should be a lot more equipped for these sort of uh, ways in which 
ultimately there need not be an original, that the original need not matter. As much as we are inclined toward thinking of content as all valuable, as I said a moment ago, we are at the same time uh, finding ourselves more and more insistent as a society on what is the original, what is the authentic, where and when does it come from, and what is the provenance. Mm. In in my more irritable moments, I sometimes think of I think of how much people talk about authenticity, how much importance some place on, on that sort of elusive quality, and I think of authenticity as what we're left with when we can't when we can't discriminate on uh, perhaps more relevant levels. Quality, for instance, though quality is no more is no less elusive. I mean, authenticity is 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 is, is a is something you can always go to when, when everything else has has failed you. You can you can say, well, I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know if that's worthwhile or not. I don't know what that means, but I can tell you if it was only touched by one guy with one brush. Do, do you know what I mean? Yes, it seems that authenticity is really the word that we've been circling around for uh, for the last five or ten minutes, and remains in spite of our. Uh, are circling uh, as elusive as ever. What would seem to me to be a way of thinking of authenticity might be that authenticity is always in terms of the speaker, in terms of the one who is looking, Mm -hmm. and in terms of the moment of that experience. So this is authentic is a way of saying this is authentic to me right now. Right. But that isn't going to go over very well in, in the courtroom. <laughs> I, the example I always think of, I guess because I'm sitting here in San Francisco and I come from Los Angeles, both towns where food is very important and the, the foods of the world have such a presence. People will get into conversations about what's the most authentic Vietnamese food or Thai food. What's the most authentic Mexican food? And it seems like at some point, they're not arguing about how true it is to where it comes from, are they? You've, you've heard these arguments, I'm sure. Uh, I, I've not only heard them, I've uh, had these arguments with my wife who oh. comes from Italy. Oh. And so she is insistent that there is a uh, an authentic Italian food and spaghetti with meatballs is not yeah. <laughs> but who's, I'm who's insist- arguing that it is? I, uh, were you? I think that spaghetti with meatballs is absolutely authentic as Italian food because spaghetti with meatballs is a is a food that has a heritage that is as legitimate as a heritage that literally is on Italian soil. Uh, spaghetti with meatballs seems to have been a kind of American... Um, Italian-American attempt at making a lunchbox that would contain the two parts of the meal that that a man, always a man at the time, was expected to have in the middle of the day on the construction site because that's where the, the, where he went. And mm. so the spaghetti and the meatball would get mixed up and this became something. There was an organic process by which spaghetti and meatballs became a dish. And right. that, to me, doesn't seem different from the way in which um, spaghetti carbonara, for instance, right. became an authentic dish. Everything has some some moment of origin or moments of origin, which we may or may not be able to find and which may be by necessity or by art and has an evolutionary process and ultimately distributes in society or in some sector thereof in a way that mutation takes place, in a way that it assimilates. Hmm. And I would say that to me, if you're talking about authenticity... I don't know of any factor you can use that would say that Mexican food from Mexico was any more authentic than a burrito, which 
does not come from Mexico. <laughs> Especially the burritos in their own incarnation here. Uh, for example, down in the mission, well, I was eating one the other day and kind of regretted it later, but it was good in the moment. It sounds like maybe authenticity isn't the word here, but I, yes, I see what you mean. The, the It sounds like your wife is saying it's authentic if you can trace it directly to some region of Italy. And you're saying spaghetti and meatballs, that's authentic to where it where it comes from, perhaps it's it's uh, it, it's it's a hybrid. It's authentic to the it's authentic to the process of hybridization with uh, American cuisine and Italian. Perhaps in the way that Chinese food, when introduced to America, became its own third cuisine. Does that make sense? Well, hybridization is always taking place. Uh, you can speak of hybridization taking place from region to region or neighborhood to neighborhood. And there always are attempts at uh, purification as well. And these two contrary forces are ultimately uh, productive in concert with each other in terms of getting us past our habit of, uh, of foraging for whatever happened to be uh, available in the way of nuts and berries. Mm. So... I don't see any value added to saying that this specific food somehow comes from this region, that that somehow makes it more, that it makes it more authentic when authentic means legitimate. And I don't know of any case in which someone who uses the term authentic does not mean legitimate. Mm -hmm. So authentic to this specific historical process that happened in this place with this group of people, okay, that you can potentially do. You can trace a provenance for uh, for a dish, and maybe you can't do it perfectly, but hypothetically, you could do it very well. Mm. But I don't really think that that's what anyone is talking about. It is ultimately a, a value judgment and a value judgment that doesn't seem to me to be uh, to have much value. It brings to mind a bit of a tension I sense here in San Francisco where you make your home most of the year, which is that San Francisco both seems, it seems caught between on one side adhering to its authentic uh, historical aesthetic political identity but then also being the place, and maybe this is true more of the greater Bay Area, being true of the, or it's, maybe this is more true of the greater Bay Area, but being the place where where utopia might be achieved, where where humanity's future is being tested. And it, those those pull in opposite directions in some sense. Is, is, that, is that something you've felt here? Well, San Francisco is at once, I think, incredibly smug and very insecure. And... Those might be slightly less positive ways of putting the two sides of it that you have just observed. Mm -hmm. And I think that neither of these things on its own is productive or appealing, but the two of them together actually are really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this constant striving at the same time that there is this sense of having some enormous worth and therefore there is momentum at the same time that there is some sort of sense of uh, of place and the momentum is often going in directions that make absolutely no sense and <laughs> the reasons for thinking that things are um, the best of all possible worlds are often not especially well thought through or uh, supportable, but that tension is highly appealing. Does it show up in your lived day-to-day -day experience of the place, or is it more of, a, of an abstraction that you can sort of draw from that's kind of in, in the air, if, if you know what I mean? In San Francisco, it is very easy to experiment, to try things out. Mm. But at the same time, that San Francisco is a place that has a level of complacency to it because, because San Francisco sees itself as 
the most experimental place. There's nothing that makes you less experimental than, than that belief. <laughs> so I feel that liberty, that freedom at the same time that I feel that making use of that freedom in a way that actually engages people is so much more difficult than it seems to be in a place like New York, for instance, that is so many different things all of the time that mm. there is not a clear through line, a clear identity that um, you need to struggle against. I notice that European visitors seem to enjoy San Francisco and it gets talked about as the, the sort of most, most European city on the West Coast and the other, the other most acceptable city in America to European visitors seems to be New York. And I have the feeling, I mean, I enjoy those cities. I enjoy San Francisco. I feel like if I lived here, I might think to myself, well, I live in San Francisco. Do I, does that mean I want to live in New York? And if I lived in New York, then I would think, well, does this mean I want to live in an actual European city and find myself being pulled towards some sort of point of city origin from which these seem to have descended one by one. I don't know if that actually works when people move here, but do you see what I mean? It's almost like I feel like I might get pulled back through the previous versions of these cities back to the back to the point of origin. Uh, that, that sounds very, very confusing now that I say it, but uh, do, you, do you draw anything from that? First of all, your observation coincides with mine that Europeans tend to be most comfortable here and in New York. And in both cases, it may have to do with the history of immigration. And I think also to do with the um, physical environment, the, the urban quality, mm. the piled upon uh, or urban quality that you find in both places in different ways. I think that they are, well, beyond being different from one another, that they don't seem to me to be quasi-European. Mm. They seem to me to have a... Uh, point of commonality with European cities that is kind of a meeting point rather than uh, having an arrow to it. Mm. Because to me, to take the line that you have, that San Francisco is to New York, what New York is to London or to Paris, I don't really think that I see it that way. I, I think that the differences between Europe and the United States are so enormously vast. And this doesn't even get into the issue of how enormously vast the differences are between London and Paris, mm. that finding some natural uh, current that draws you one way or another i think that i think it's mostly cross currents mm. it's it gets at i, I suppose the, 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 it's, it seems to me the, there's a natural human impulse here to want to get to the source of w whatever you happen to be doing uh wherever you happen to be and if if the if it's not an actual current it could could as well be a, a frustrated impulse like uh i mean one place w where did w what uh it doesn't make sense to say where did this place originate, but you always wonder what you're, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whatever you have, there's that part of your brain that's always thinking, yeah, but what's the original? What did this come from? And that, and that, that uh, does that resonate with the thoughts you've had about, about these subjects? One of the things that is most interesting about American cities is that they tend to have so many points of origin mm. and this has to do with the history of immigration amongst other historical factors that make it so that you really can't find your way back 
to where something came from because it's all hybridized to such an extent at this stage that there there is no earlier version of any of the hybrid qualities that you experience here and every quality that you experience here is hybrid. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you would need to reverse engineer whatever it was down to constituents that would come from different places. And then you would need to clone yourself, I suppose, (laughs) and to situate yourself in all those different places. And if you want to clone yourself, I can help you. Right. I think you might have your next project, although you probably have the next 10 lined up. (laughs) Well, cloning myself actually is part of the human cloning project Mm. that I'm undertaking. I guess crowdsourcing has gotten to my head, (laughs) but I have developed a simple bottle of pills that anyone can take daily. I wouldn't advise it for Mm. all sorts of reasons, (laughs) but based on my own um, biochemical experience, I basically just give you a much higher dose of it and hope for the best. Right. So there's hoping for the best is the stage these things tend to come to, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, the final stage of so many of your projects seems to be hope for the best. And that's that's one of the things that fascinates me about them. Well, yes, as I have said already, they are thought experiments. Mm. And as thought experiments, they are open in every way, open to interpretation, but also open to eventualities. Mm. And hope for the best, I would not say that that would be the common thing theme because I don't think that there really is ever a defined best Mm -hmm. Uh, hope for something or other hope for something interesting would that work sure I, I, I think that the criterion that I would use above all other for whether a project was successful would be whether it resulted in questions larger than those that led me into the project. Mm. Whether it's a curiosity amplifier, let's say. And acting on this curiosity, being experimental, I mean, you've observed that the more a place like San Francisco decides it's experimental, the harder it is for it to actually be that. How, how is this as an area for for you to be experimental in? It, it seems like it works well for you, but... Um, Tell me what you've actually found. I've found networks of support here, institutionally speaking, mm. that have helped to facilitate these projects. I've been, every year for the past decade, I've had a project at Modernism Gallery, which has been enormously patient with me as I lose all sorts of money for them every year. I have also been able to do projects at the Berkeley Art Museum, the Crocker in Sacramento and the Magnus Museum and various other places that have been very generous with me. And yet at the same time, I feel like reaching audiences here is enormously difficult. Mm. Working out of San Francisco, I find to be very productive. But I think that working out of San Francisco and Putting the work elsewhere often tends to be more um, more productive in a certain way in terms of the thought experiment really taking off in unpredictable ways. And partly that, that elsewhere might be New York, for instance, uh, or, uh, or London or someplace of the sort of Berlin. Mm-hmm. But... Also, that elsewhere is the everywhere that is the internet. And I try with my work always to keep it open source and to put it out into the media as a way of letting it exist independent of me in uh, on the web in this world that is everywhere and nowhere where anyone can participate in it. Trying to engage San Francisco locals in this sort of work, I find that people tend to be 
quite courteous and they feel like there's a certain level of um, obligation in a way. This is an experimental place after all. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the willingness really to take the idea and see where it goes, that is very difficult to achieve here. I can't help but ask about this. I've been curious. You know, you spend you spend part of the year in, in Italy, and I, I wonder, as a culture, how 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 you sense that place is receptive to, or would be receptive to something like a grand scale thought experiment or experimental philosophy or or the kinds of subjects you deal with. I I really have no idea whether whether Italy uh, culturally is into that kind of thing or not. So far, I've done a few projects in Italy. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind was a project that started here where I um, was attempting to give plants the opportunity to enjoy what we do every day, which is a good meal, uh, to, in other words, make a gourmet cuisine for the plants that are often our gourmet cuisine <laughs> to reciprocate. And so that cuisine was naturally photosynthetic. So I I made a photosynthetic restaurant for plants in Sacramento at the Crocker Art Museum, which involved using color filters uh, that would filter sunlight, the most natural ingredient around if you're a plant, in ways that I had analyzed the spectrum and looked at the uh, physiological effects of different parts of the spectrum on plants and then attempted to use the um, logic underlying some of the great cookbooks, uh, such as Julia Child's cookbook, to figure out what physiologically was going on inside of us that made gourmet cuisines appealing to us and to attempt for plants to deliver that sort of experience. Mm -hmm. So having done that and having opened a photosynthetic restaurant, I decided that I wanted to make this more widely available. And so I created TV dinners for plants. And these TV dinners involve taking footage of the sky through different color filters and then on a TV screen having a uh, fast food mix that was around five minutes long and a slow food mix that was about an hour mm. that you could put your plants in front of the television and they could get this gourmet cuisine in that sort of mediated way. And so that was shown in Italy. And from what I understand, it was well received by both plants and people. <laughs> so I think that there is absolutely a side to Italy that is very much out of a grand tradition. Um, all European cities have this. Uh, all European countries have this. But at the same time that there is a, uh, there's another side that is very vehemently experimental, mm. not posing as experimental, but actively resisting the culture, the high culture of the place in a way that feels to me to be very much alive. The The Share Festival in Torino, which I have uh, given a talk remotely via Skype, mm. uh, shows you that they're definitely out of the Middle Ages. Uh, they certainly are a part of this world that I really admire and would like to participate in more. It's a, it's a kind of legitimate, a, a dose of very legitimate experimentalism, um, whereas here you get a mixture of the legitimate and the, and the illegitimate experimentalism at once, it's, it sounds like. I think that there's... A a sort of experimentalism by necessity in in Europe, in places, and certainly not everywhere and not everyone, but there is a level of freedom from history, from that high culture here, an unmoored quality that is what is so liberating about life 
in the United States mm. that leads to a certain numbness, a certain um, ambivalence or lack of interest, I guess, lack of engagement in the things that we have the opportunity to partake of. Mm. And because Europe is perhaps a little more starved for these things, there is more of a uh, voraciousness when they come along. Which is not to say that what I'm doing is especially worthwhile, <laughs> um, but is to say that what I'm doing is in line with th this more experimental turn in how to live and, and how to think. It comes out of that inclination, and so people tend to embrace it. I've been speaking here between Chinatown, Knob Hill, and Russian Hill with writer, experimental philosopher, conceptual artist, critic Jonathan Keats, whose new book comes out in December, Forged, Why Fakes Are the Great Art of Our Time. Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.